Melbourne from the University of uh, Warwick and he's going to show that the Lorentz attractor is exponentially mixing. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much and thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to talk to here and uh, happy birthday to Wellington. And um, yeah, it's a really great place. So I should mention my co-authors. Um, so they're Vitor Rijo and Paolo Verandas, who are Ufba in Salvador. And yeah, we're going to talk about the Lorentz attractor being exponentially mixing. So that's why I write down what the Lorentz equations are, just, just to recall. So these, these are the Lorentz, classical Lorentz equations from Lorentz 1963 um, with the classical parameters that you have the usual picture. Important thing is there's an equilibrium at the origin. Actually, people use lots of different words, fixed point, critical point, singularity. I call it equilibrium. It's just the place where the right-hand side vanishes and there's one at the origin, zero, zero, zero. And there are three eigenvalues, uh, lambda 1, less than lambda 2, less than 0, less than lambda 3. Um, to show that the eigenvalues of the linearized vector field at the origin. So there's two stable ones, one unstable one. The values, which will turn out to be important later on, are minus 22.83, roughly, minus 8 thirds, and 11.83. So for the moment, the important thing is that this one is bigger in magnitude than that one. So that's a characteristic property of, of the Lorentz attractor. So, um, so I, I guess um, there's also, of course, a link with one-dimensional dynamics because you can take a Poincaré map to the flow so if you, at the origin, you can set things up so that uh, these are the axes corresponding to the three eigendirections. And uh, maybe something like that. And just uh, put a cross-section here and a cross-section there. So it goes from a three-dimensional flow to a two-dimensional Poincaré map. And then you also have a stable foliation, so you can crunch out the stable foliation to get a one-dimensional expanding map. So um, this quotient out the stable direction. And then you get a map F, which goes from minus 1. You can choose, you can rescale things. That so goes from minus 1, 1 to itself, and the picture looks um, something like this. And this point here, where there's a kind of singular behavior of the map, because the derivatives blow up at zero, kind of correspond to here in the, uh, in, the, in the Poincaré map. So it corresponds to the equilibrium for the vector field. So some more notation, I'll, I'll, I'll abbreviate this to p dot equals g of p. So g is just a three-dimensional vector field, and it has a three-dimensional flow, which I'll call x sub t. And so one of, um, in fact, I think it was Smale's 14th problem um, for the 21st century was to show that there was some kind of strange attractor for these, uh, for these uh, differential equations. And that was a result of Tucker in 2000 which is that, in some sense, the Lorentz attractor the Lorentz attractor exists. And more precisely, what the, what the claim is, is that there exists a robustly transitive attractor
robustly, sorry, robustly transitive attractor, lambda, for the three-dimensional flow, so this is contained in R3, with zero contained in lambda, and also satisfying a condition L dot E dot O, which is locally eventually onto. So, so, so this is what his paper says, that for these parameters, there exists a robustly transitive attractor containing zero and satisfying um, the locally eventually onto condition. So definitions to explain what these things are, uh, we say that lambda is robustly um, transitive attractor if there exists an open set U containing the attractor, so some kind, of, some kind of isolating set containing the attractor, such that what you, well, what you normally want is that um, if you do the flow, if you take the intersection over all positive T of X sub T of U, you would want that equals lambda. That would be being an attractor, and you want it to be too transitive. But what you have to do is you have to look at nearby flows. So you want that this, that X tilde T, which I'd explain in a moment, has the property that you get a lambda tilde, which is going to be um, transitive and non-trivial for all X T tilde um, corresponding to G tilde C1 close to G. probably legible, but I'll say it again in words. You have to look at all vector fields that are C1 close to the vector field you start with. You look at the corresponding flow. You apply, you apply that corresponding flow to this fixed open neighborhood U, and that has to give you a transitive non-trivial set. And non-trivial just means that it, it shouldn't just be a single periodic orbit, and it shouldn't just be a single equilibrium. Okay, so that's, um, that's a definition of robustly transitive, and I can fit... Um, LEO here. So LEO is a co is it locally eventually onto is a property of the map F that we got over here when we um, went to the Poincaré map and quotient sent out stable directions. We get a one dimensional map, and this should have the property that for every interval i contained in minus one one, there exists a k rate equal to zero, such that f to the k of i contains zero, one, let's say. So you want to know that if you take a very small interval here and iterate it under the dynamics, eventually it covers at least all the way from zero to one. That's the locally eventually onto condition. Okay, so that's, um, that was Tucker's paper. And then... So then there's some history that follows on from this. Actually, a lot of the history precedes it as well. The point was that um, in the 70s, people tried to axiomize what was going on in the Lorentz equations. You couldn't actually work with the Lorentz equations at that point, but you could see what you thought was happening and then try to prove theorems about it. So this was um, in the 70s. There was a um, group, Ab Ab Abramovich, Bikov, and Shulnikov, and independently, Guggenheimer and Williams, who set up this idea of a geometric Lorentz attractor that was supposed to do what ha happened in the actual equations. And then people proved lots of theorems about it. And so one, one thing is that there should exist a SRB measure. And, and so an SRB measure, well, it's supposed to be some kind of a godic measure. So um, you should have that if you look at 1 over t, integral from 0 to t, observe the flow and take the limit as t goes to infinity, this should converge to the integral v d mu. So if you have that this happens almost everywhere for every L1 function v, then that's just being a godic. But the problem with that is it's almost everywhere with respect to the invariant measure. And because the attractor has volume zero, you, you won't actually see any of those initial conditions. 
So a physical measure is, I really should have said physical measure, is one where this holds for all continuous V and for almost every, and for Lebesgue, almost every initial condition. So maybe I should put P here. There is my initial condition. And then the claim is that this is now physical because we can see almost every Lebesgue P is a physical thing. And no matter what the continuous V we take, we get this convergence. And the only place the measure appears is actually in the right-hand side. OK, so that's, um, that was um, SRB measure. And um, I want to keep these values. So, I, OK, so I'll put a circle around here. And I should have, should have written that somewhere else. And um, so I'm interested in mixing properties. So the first result on mixing was due to uh, Marina Ratner in 1978. And what she proved is that if lambda is weak mixing, then it is Bernoulli. And Bernoulli in particular means mixing. So the claim was, if you could prove weak mixing, then you could get mixing. And then there's a big gap in the history. Um, lots of things happened, of course. But, well, but for this story, there's a paper that, I've, that involved Stefano Lozato, uh, myself, and Frédéric Paco in um, 05. And we proved, we proved that it is weak mixing. So lambda is weak mixing. And in particular, that means it's mixing. And I'll write down the definition of that. But it's all with respect to the SRB measure. And so mixing means that if I look at, um, two, if I look at two sets, A and B, and look to see how they kind of intersect each other, if I apply the flow to one of them, then this converges to a number. And that number should depend on how big A is and how big B is. And in fact, it converges to the measure of A times the measure of B. So if you think about what, mi what mixing should happen in a fluid, what it should mean for a fluid to mix, then this is, this is actually what should happen. So, um, so that was what we proved in 2005. And then it's reasonable to ask, how quickly do things mix? And so um, it turns out that in, th in this situation, it's going to mix arbitrarily slowly. You have to put some regularity in. So what we do is we take observables, V and W, that go from R3 to R. We define rho of VW of T to be the integral over the attractor of VW composed with X sub T minus integral of V integral of W. So this, is a, this kind of object corresponds to this where you can think of V and W as just being indicator functions then of A and B, then you would get precisely this on, you would precisely get precisely this minus that. But now we can ask that V and W are regular. And so the theorem, so the, this is the main theorem of the talk, is that, um, I, guess a, I guess it's a mixture of papers in 2015 and 16, is that this decays exponentially provided you work with holder observables. So it says that for any eta, there exists constant C and A positive, such that if you look at rho of VW of T, so this quantity over here, this decays at an exponential rate with those constants times the holder norm of V and the holder norm of W. And this holds for all V and W in C eta and for all T basically to zero. Now, we don't get any results on how big C and A are, but the, but the, point, the important thing is we get a rate. We get the exponential rate, which is what people kind of want in this, in this kind of field. Um, and by the way, I should also mention that if you just make this C zero, then again, there's no way you can get a rate for continuous functions. You have to have some regularity beyond continuity. This says that any holdingness will do.
Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem. So you can see what it says. And now, now I want to do some more history. Again, it's going to have lots of gaps in it. But this history is going to be about proving theorems of this type. So I go all the way back to the 1970s when people were working on axiom adiphyomorphisms. So discrete time. And in this situation, we know, we know that with an axiom adiphyomorphism, you have a spectral decomposition. So you can break, it, break things up into finitely many basic sets that are mixing up to a finite cycle. So let's restrict to the case where it's mixing. And then Sinai, Ruel, and Bowen in various papers proved that mixing implies exponential mixing. So you have a complete picture of what happens for um, axiom A diffeomorphisms. So the natural thing is to look at axiom A flows. So this is 1975 for axiom A flows. And this was a paper by um, Bowen and Ruel. And it was a conjecture. Which again, the conjecture based on this is that hopefully mixing implies exponential mixing. But this conjecture didn't get very far. So there's a, there are various papers in 1983, 84, and 85 by Pollicott and Ruel. And they show that this conjecture is false. And um, so what happened was in 1983 and 84, independently, Pollicott and Ruel showed that um, you could have mixing axiom A flows that weren't exponentially mixing. And then Pollicott in 1985 proved that you could have mixing axiom A flows that mix arbitrarily slowly. So this was the picture back then. And this picture didn't change for a long time until 1998, when there was a new idea due to Chernov and then polished off by Polycott, so not, not Polycott, this time, Dolgo Piat. So the final result is due to Dolgo Piat, but he used, an, used some important ideas of Chernov, and this, this was a major breakthrough. And this showed, they looked at Anosov flows, and they assumed two things. They assumed that the stable and unstable foliations were C1. Whenever I write stable and unstable foliations, I'm talking about, the, about just the stable direction for the, for the, for the flow. So there's the, for, for axiom A flows, you have stable, central, and unstable directions. Here we're just looking at the stable and unstable directions separately and asking that they're, that they're C1. And they also assumed a condition which often gets called JNI, that doesn't really make sense. What, what, what this, this stands for joint non-integrability but it really means non-joint integrability. It's asking that, you know this foliation's integrable, you know that one's integrable, are the two together jointly integrable? And if not, you say it's non-jointly integrable, and that's J and I. And these two conditions together imply exponential mixing. And in particular, you can show that these conditions are satisfied for geodesic flow on a compact surface of non-negative curvature. So, so they, this gives good examples of things that are exponentially mixing. On the other hand, there's a couple of things. One thing about this is that joint non-integrability is roughly mixing plus a bit. So um, in fact, it's a conjecture. It's a conjecture for Nossoff flows that these two things are the same, that mixing is the same as joint non-integrability. But that's not been proved, but it's certainly slightly stronger. And um, this condition is open and dense by results of Brit. It's open in a very strong sense, C1 open, dense in a very strong sense, C infinity dense. So this is a pretty satisfactory condition, but this condition is definitely not satisfactory. It's pathological that both foliations will be C1. You're, you're never going to have that, or you might have it, but perturb it slightly, and this situation will not persist. So this condition is slightly problematic. Um, but then there were papers in 2005 and 2006 so there's a pair of papers, first of all by Balladie and Vallée. 
And then by, okay, so it's three authors I abbreviated, AGY is Avila, Guzel, and Yokoz. And these two papers together, they're now looking at um, not just Anosov flows, but also Axiom A flows. And moreover, they're looking at non-uniform, a certain class of non-uniformly hyperbolic flows. So they, in particular, they applied these things to Teichmuller, to Teichmuller flows. And they had, um, they, they now required that WS is C2 and joint non-integrability. And these two things together imply exponential mixing. And the reason why this result is actually, in many ways, a, a lot nicer is where Jay and I, we already said, was a perfectly good condition. This condition is still a restriction that the stable manifold is C2, but it's no longer pathological. You can have bunching conditions that makes one of the, one of the stable foliations can be as smooth as you like under bunching conditions, and those bunching conditions are robust. So you can now come up with robust examples of things that are exponentially mixing, which was impossible before, before these papers. And um, then there was a paper more recently, 2016, um, by Vitor and myself, which is still in the same context, axiom A flows and non-uniformly hyperbolic flows, and we proved that WS C1 plus epsilon plus joint non-integrability implies exponential mixing. And so, so it turns out this, this is also, um, it may not, look, not, may not look like much of an improvement, but often if you have a co-dimension one foliation or something that's roughly co-dimension one, then you can expect this kind of thing, even if you can't expect that kind of thing. And it turns out to be crucial for the Lorenzo tractor. So the Lorenzo tractor, it seems extremely unlikely that the foliations are C2, for reasons I'll explain later on, but they do turn out to be C1 plus epsilon. So this result is, is important. Okay, so that's, um, that's my history. Again, I said that there's lots of bits missing, lots of work by Liberani and various other people that's very important, but it doesn't fit into this picture. So I've just stuck with what I need. Okay, so... Um, so now maybe I'll try to... Um, State, an, another way of stating it, the main results of this talk. So far, I've just said it's for the classical Lorentz attractor, and it's kind of relying on Tucker's work. So Tucker's work, as you probably know, involves um, a computer, it's a computer-assisted proof. It uses numeric, rigorous numerical calculations. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see which bits you need the rigor for, which bits you need the numerics for, and which bits can be done by a more standard mathematical proof. So I'm going to say what we get if we take Tucker's output. So theorem one is that suppose that lambda contained in R3 is um, robustly transitive and satisfying locally eventually onto. So suppose we take it as given that we're given a robustly transitive attractor that's locally eventually onto, where can we get? And I'm going to assume there exists greater or equal to one equilibria in lambda, which we certainly know is true. And I'm going to assume that the stable foliation is C1 plus epsilon. Then, so then you have joint non-integrability. So the claim is that if you have a robustly transitive attractor satisfying LEO and containing an equilibrium, and with a nice stable foliation, then you get the joint non-integrability, which by the result in the bottom right corner um, gives you the exponential mixing. Yeah? And then joint non-integrability. Sorry? Joint J and I. Now that, that was over here. So this was... Um, It, it mean, it, J, J and I, unfortunately, is what people write, but as I said, it should be NJI. It should be, it's not, it's, 
JI would be jointly integrable, so it should be NJI, which is non-jointly integrable. But for some reason, people call it, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's non, JNI equals non-joint integrability of uh, ES EU. Okay. All right, so um, that was the first theorem, that we can get the joint non-integrability from everything else, which finishes the theorem. And the second theorem... is that um, if, if, if we're actually taking the, the Lorentz equations or nearby and you have lambda contained in R3 um, robustly transitive with zero contained in lambda, of course, then this implies that Ws is C1 plus epsilon. So what I'm claiming here is if you know you've got robust transitivity with zero contained in it, actually even without zero contained, I don't think you, don't, I don't think you need the zero here. So if you have a robustly transitive attractor in R3, then there are some, there's, a, there's, there's an analytically checkable thing that will give you C1 plus epsilon stable foliation. And that analytically checkable thing is satisfied for the Lorentz equations and for lots of other things as well. Okay, so that's, that's the two things. And now, um, now I get to a really key point. So I think, I think we saw this earlier this week in, might be Marco Martin's talk, where I'm not quite sure, but there's a talk where people, somebody was talking about the fact that there's no structure. And one big problem we have here is that um, if you've just got top robust transitivity, it's not at all clear that you've got any structure for actually proving anything. In the XMA case, which we started off with here, you have a closed splitting into stable directions and unstable directions. So the key ingredient here we need is um, a paper by um, um, Morales, uh, Pacifico, and Pujols. So, um, So this is a paper in Annals of Math in 2004 by Morales, Pacifico, and Pujols. And it says that if you have a, it says that if you have a robustly transitive attractor in R3, then you have lots of structure. So um, lambda contained in R3, robustly transitive, implies that it's singular hyperbolic. And singular hyperbolic basically is like axiom A, plus or minus equilibria. So basically, if, 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 if Tucker had said that the thing was structurally stable, then we would have known we were in the axiom A case. But we can't be in the axiom A case because it's equilibria. So singularly hyperbolic is something that includes the axiom A case, but also includes things that are almost axiom A up to the fact that there exists equilibria there. So um, that's, I can give a precise definition. Um, There exists a closed um, DXT invariant splitting, not closed, I mean continuous, a continuous uh, derivative of the flow invariant splitting um, of, the ta of the tangent space um, over, the, over the set, and it's equal to You have two, a one-dimensional bundle, which I call ES, and a two-dimensional bundle, which I call ECU. And then you have various things happening. So in this, in this one, this is supposed to be like the stable bundle, so you have lots of contraction. So there exists constants These are not the constants that we've in my main theorem, but they, they, they play a similar kind of role. So um, if I look at DXT, on a, on a um, fiber in the stable bundle, then this is going to um, contract exponentially. So this is going to be for all x in lambda and for all t greater than zero, then we get this kind of estimate. We get the exponential contraction. 
we don't get exponential expansion in here, but we do get that this dominates that one. So what that means is that dxt exs, if you multiply this by dx minus t extx cu, then this is also satisfies a bound of the same form. And, and so, so what this is saying is that um, over, over most of the attractor, you might expect that this consists of unstable directions and the flow direction, which is neutral, in which case clearly this, will, this one will be negative and that one will be zero, and so everything is going to be fine. But um, you also have to worry about the fact there's an equilibrium there. And at the equilibrium, you've got two stable directions. So lambda 1 is going to be in here, and it's going to dominate lambda 2, which would be in there. So this, this ECU can contain, a, can contain contracting directions because near the equilibrium, we're going to have to have that. But it also contains the flow direction. And then there's a th third condition, which is that um, if we look at the determinant of XT um, on ECUX, then that expands. So C inverse E to the AT. And that you can also see is consistent with this condition here, the fact that the unstable direction dominated the weak stable direction means that this area is growing. And so you have volume expansion in the central direction. So this is the definition of being um, singular hyperbolic. And you can, see, you can see it's a generalization of axiom A, and it's consistent with the data that we were given. So that's, uh, that's the key thing we need. All right, so... Um, So now, for the rest of the talk, I have to talk about um, these two kind of results, that we want to get a, the joint non-integrability condition, and we want to get the um, stable foliation. So I'll start with the easier one, which is the stable foliation. So, um, first of all, I should say what I mean by stable foliation, because... Um, for smooth things, smooth foliations is not a universally well-defined concept. There are lots of different versions of it. But what I mean by this is that you have charts that take leaves to straight lines, such that the charts are C1 plus epsilon diffeomorphisms. So it's a, it's a condition on the chart. And, um, and then, then we ran into a slight problem, because actually it wasn't clear that we even had a topological foliation. Because um, we have an attractor, we, we certainly have enough structure that, ev it, that through every stable leaf, through every stable, everything in the stable bundle, we can find a stable leaf that's tangent to it, and those stable leaves will be nice and smooth, nice and smooth as usual. If it, if it was an axiom A attractor, you would know those stable leaves would foliate a neighbourhood of the attractor. But that's not, that's not going to happen for a singular hyperbolic thing. The stable leaves might behave very badly near the singularity, and you don't actually know. In fact, I think, I think it's known that it's not true that the stable leaves corresponding to this bundle foliate a neighbourhood of the attractor. But what you can do is you can extend it. So this is, this is a lemma, um, which, which was uh, a bit of myself, which is that, um, that um, ES extends continuously to an, inv an invariant contracting bundle over a neighbourhood U of lambda. Okay, so that's the first thing. That we've got this stable bundle over lambda here, and it's invariant and it's contracting, but we can extend it to a bundle over a neighbourhood of lambda. And once we've got that, we, we, can, get look at, we can look at WS... And WS is always going to be a topological foliation of lambda. Okay, so, um, so the, the, the centre-unstable bundle might not extend, at least not in an invariant way, 
but the claim is that the stable one always extends, and then you can integrate it and get a topological foliation of the attractor, of a neighbourhood of the attractor. So that's the, that's the first thing. And then we also verified that if you had Q bunching, that you got, um, you got smooth foliation. So, and Q bunching implies, um, implies WS is a CQ foliation. So you already know that the leaves are smooth, but they fit together in a nice smooth way. So. On, and Q bunching implies smooth foliation. And the Q bunching is the usual condition where you take the left hand side over here, D, X, T, um, E, X, S, D, X minus T, E, X, E, X, T, X, C, U. And then we want um, to put dxt exCU to the Q. So this is the, the usual form of the bunching addition. And the quantifiers are that for any x, there exists a t such that, no, not the other way around. Sorry. There exists a t such that for all x, this quantity is less than 1. Okay, so that's the, that's the Q bunching condition, and so it's kind of classical, and you just check that the things work, that this kind of condition would give you a smooth foliation. And then we also showed, that this was actually, um, this was the three of us, showed that um, for classical Lorentz, Q is bigger than 1. So we have our uh, smooth, stable foliation. In fact, Q is bigger than... Uh, in fact, um, Q, the Q, I don't know how big this Q is, but I know I have estimates on this Q. This Q lies between 1.278 and 1.704. This, this Q might be bigger, but that would be a gigantic fluke. So it could, this is definitely not too bunched. This might be C2 smooth, but that would be, that would be somewhat unexpected. And we know that Q can't be bigger than 1.704 because basically if you look at the eigenvalues, you need that um, lambda 1 plus um, Q minus Q lambda 2 plus lambda 3 should be less than 0. I think that's a condition. So, um, so this condition is not automatic. This is actually a big stroke of luck for the Lorentz equations. We knew, we knew that this condition would be satisfied because that's why people have been studying these for a long time and we know that this condition holds. But to get the smooth foliation, if this thing had been a lot bigger, then we could have had problems. But you can check that actually if you take Q to be 1.704, this thing holds. And, you, and, you can't, and of course this condition includes what happens when X is equal to zero. So you, you can't do better the 1.704, and then you have to check that um, all the other x's are okay as well. Um, and that there, it's, there we have to use the full strength of the fact that we have uh, a singular hyperbolic uh, vector field. Now for classical events and for large classes of things nearby, Q will be bigger than 1. So that's um, the, uh, that, that was the, this condition. And that leaves us with um, joint non-integrability, which is the hard part. I don't think I need this anymore. So the hard lemma, which was through, which we actually got quite a bit earlier um, in 2015, was that um, if you've got robustly transitive, locally eventually onto, Race them equal to one equilibrium and um, WSC1 plus epsilon, then this implies joint non integrability. 
My, my claim is this is by far the hardest part of the proof, and I'm not even going to try to say anything about it. But I told you at the beginning that joint non-integrability was not so different from mixing. So I'm, what I'm going to try to do is show you why mixing holds. So, so the easier version is that all of these conditions imply mixing. And this is um, this was the paper by Lozato. Paco and myself in 2005. This, this bit actually even involves one-dimensional dynamics, so this is the bit that fits into the, uh, into the meeting most of all. Um, so if we want to prove mixing, then by Ratner's result in 1978, it suffices to prove weak mixing. So by Ratner, It suffices to prove weak mixing. And it's well known that you can characterize weak mixing by, in terms of eigenfunctions. So equivalently, it turns out that, um, OK, so I, uh, OK, I've missed out some bits. So let's remember our, if we have our expanding map, F, Okay, so that was the expanding map that came when we took the Poincaré map, crunch out the stable leaves, this is the expanding map. There's also a return time function corresponding to the Poincaré map, which has a logarithmic singularity at the equilibrium. So this is the return time R, and that has a log singularity at zero. And... Then we can form the suspension flow. In fact, it's a suspension, a suspension semi-flow where you draw, you draw your roof function over your interval minus 1, 1. You've got your map F that kind of goes from the base to itself. And you form a suspension semi-flow by here's a point X, and you move upwards. And when you hit the roof, you go to F of X and then keep on going. So you, you use the dynamics from this one-dimensional map to identify points on the base, and apart from that, you just flow upwards under the roof function. So, um, equivalent, so I, have to, I just have to show by Ratner that F sub T is weak mixing. And equivalently, what I should do is I should look at the equation V composed with F, this F, and that should equal E to... If I, I ask, is this equal to e to the i alpha r v. And I look for solutions of this equation. Now, if I put alpha equals zero, this just becomes v composed with f equals v, which by a gadicity tells us that v has to be constant. What I want to do is I want to look at alpha non-zero and show that there do not exist measurable solutions. So I want to show that for every alpha that's non-zero, there's no measurable solution to this equation. That's equivalent to showing weak mixing of the semi-flow which is also equivalent to weak, flow, weak mixing of the flow, and therefore, by Ratner, equivalent to mixing of the flow. Okay, so I have to show this. Now, it's easy, it's easy to rule out continuous functions. So this is what I have to show. So first of all, I show, show you why there do not exist continuous solutions, because I just plug in what's going on at this singular point, and I plug it into this equation. So I, pl I plug in yn, which goes to zero from above. Just take a sequence of points, y sub n, they go to zero from the, the right-hand side. I have v of f of yn equals e to the i alpha rn, v of so e alpha yn, v of yn. Because V is continuous, and V of Yn obviously goes to V of 0, F of Yn, well, these points are converging to minus 1. So this just converges to V of minus 1. And obviously, because of the logarithmic singularity here, this doesn't converge. 
So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's easy to rule out continuous functions because you just see what's happening near the origin, and these things are not singular, and that thing is singular, so it's not surprising that it doesn't work. Um, but the problem is because I only know that I have to rule out measurable solutions, so I can't plug in, I can't plug things in into a measurable situation. Um, so we use a Lifshitz regularity theorem. So the idea of Lifshitz regularity is that very often measurable solutions to cohomological equations turn into Holder solutions, and in particular continuous. But this, this is a slightly more delicate situation, but there are papers by um, Brown, who are supposed to be here, Holland and Nickel, and independently Grisel. So this was, these, these were around 2005, which is when we were writing this paper. And what they showed is that for any delta, sorry, there exists a delta greater than zero such that, um, such that V measurable solution implies that V is continuous on some funny set. You get minus, you can show, you can first of all show that V is continuous on a neighborhood of the origin, which is somewhat counterintuitive. The origin is where all the bad behavior is, but it turns out that's not a problem. You can prove that your measurable solution to this equation is continuous precisely where the singularity is, um, but maybe not much further, except you can also then extend it quite, it's easy to see that you can extend it to all iterates. So I can make V continuous on this set. And then I have the locally eventually onto condition. Locally eventually onto condition tells me that this is equal to minus one, one. So this is where locally eventually onto comes into the picture. And, um, and by the way, you need some condition. There's, there's, you, it's, in fact, I'm not really using locally eventually onto very strongly, but this is a convenient thing because Tucker proved it. But Satayev has examples that show that if it wasn't locally eventually onto, it might not be mixing. So I definitely need some condition. Anyway, I get this. V is continuous on the whole of the way from minus 1 to 1, but not necessarily at minus 1 or 1. So I still can't um, plug things in here because this thing goes wrong. But I just iterate this equation because I just say that uh, if I look at V of F squared of Yn, then using this equation twice, I just get E to the I alpha R Yn e to the i alpha r f of yn v of yn. So it's, and so now, you, because of the locally eventually onto, I've now got into a situation where I can apply the continuity of v. Because f squared of yn, well, f of yn was, um, yn is there, f of yn is here, f squared of yn is somewhere in the middle. So it's fine. And so this converges to um, V of F of minus 1, whatever that is. This converges to V of 0. This converges to E to the I alpha R of minus 1. And this one doesn't converge. And that's the proof that, um, that's the proof of mixing. So the claim is that some beefed up version of this also gives joint non-integrability. So one month... I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll just, I just remember, I'll just mention one open problem. An open problem is what, what would, as I mentioned, we were a bit lucky here. Um, most of the structure was not luck, because the whole point was this was this thing with lots of structure that people worked on. But the place where we were lucky was to get that the foliation was C1 plus epsilon, because that involved conditions on the eigenvalues that had nothing to do with being a Lorentz-like attractor. So what happens if it's, what happens if it's not true? Um, Somewhere we're using the fact that this map is C1 plus alpha. And the way we got this map was by crunching out the stable foliation. So if the foliation was C1 plus alpha, this would be C1 plus alpha. It turns out you don't need the stable foliation to be C1 plus alpha. There's a paper by um, APPV in 09. So this is also Pacifico and Pujols. This is Vitor. This is Marcelo Viana. And their paper shows that this is going to be C1 plus alpha anyway, because 
the holonomies corresponding to your foliation will, be, will have C1 plus alpha Jacobians using Pezin theory. And because we're in a one-dimensional situation, having, have a, having a Jacobian that's holder means that your, map, your thing is C1 plus holder. So this map will be C1 plus holder, even if the foliation is not. And that means that a lot of this analysis works, but we still don't have a smooth roof function. And it turns out we can still prove mixing, we can still prove joint non-integrability, but we can't get the exponential decay, because there's somewhere where we need that the roof function is smooth as well, even when we crunch out the stable manifolds, and that bit doesn't follow from here. So that's an open question. For, for the general situation where you haven't got smooth foliations, you still get mixing, but can you get a rate of mixing? Okay, so I'll stop there. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.